as an amazing gift that meets a, a, a mostly unmet need. Because I cannot tell you, as partial choleric, I cannot tell you how many times I have gone home having no idea what anybody thought of what I did as a speaker. Because everybody else leaves going, oh, somebody else will tell her. Somebody else will tell her. Somebody else will tell her. And part of it is that some cholerics, I'm hoping it's not me, but some cholerics can have a little bit too much of that queen of everything presence. And so they're a little bit intimidating. We want intimacy, but what we end up with is intimidation. They have almost the same letters, but they're very different. And so people can tend to be like, oh, I'll just stay at a little bit of a distance. She's kind of scary. And it's like, no, we aren't. We really aren't. Um, and so people assume that somebody else is going to give feedback. And again, you know, that was wonderful, you're wonderful, don't need to hear. But if there are any callers who are part of planning this conference, what they want to know is life change. Even if it was so small to you, it could be huge to them. It's an amazing gift. Um, when I was in college, I was the uh, reader for my major professor. And I worked really, really hard for him, and I would always alphabetize the papers so that he could hand them back in class in a certain order. And one day I was working in the English department office, and I overheard my name. And so, of course, like a sanguine, I'm like, ooh, somebody's talking about me. So I you know, go to the door and listen, and he is busy bragging about me to his colleague and talking about how he doesn't know what he would do without me and how hard I work for him and what wonderful work I do and how I make it possible for him to do more of what he does well because he doesn't have to do some of these other things. How do you think I fell? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, it was the best thing ever. I sat down and I graded twice as fast. I made up more things that I could do to make his life better and easier so he could be, a, you know, because he was a fabulous teacher who I really admired. And you know, it took me about 10 years to realize he knew I was in the office. <laughs> so he knew I could overhear. And for me, it was so much more powerful. He could have come and said just to me, Sherry, thank you, I really appreciate you. But for me to overhear him giving this detailed, um, feedback to somebody else that I also respected was amazing. And so sometimes you might be in a conversation where there's a small group and you have the opportunity to tell somebody in front of others, again, in detail, what it was that they did that they appreciated. Probably won't work as well for melancholy. Melancholies don't like being called up front for appreciation. They're like, no, no, just hand me the card under the door, I'm good. The choleric, again, it doesn't have to be so much up front as if it's just in a natural part of the, uh, of the conversation and you're able to slip it in and then just go back to the conversation, that can be incredibly, incredibly fulfilling for them to hear. So anyways, here's what a choleric is thinking, perhaps not consciously, but these are three bumper stickers that run her mind, her emotions, and often her choices. My way or no way. the highway or no way. If I can't win, I don't play. Basically, there's first place or nothing at all. And a little gratitude goes a long way. The last personality we save for last, not because it is least important, but because it is the hardest one to identify. Tell me what you notice about this person. Functional. Very functional. Very functional. What else? No nonsense. No nonsense. It's small. Are you going to be able to overload this? No. No. Is it going to give you a shoulder ache? No. Are you going to realize it's there? No. Yeah. And once you put it on, it's kind of like, you know, strap it on and go. It's yeah. no frills, no problems, no mess, no fuss. Hard to lose, easy to wear, nice, calm, green, very simple. And all of these are words that work with the phlegmatic. The visible clues that you or someone you know is a phlegmatic, the first one is that they're kind of the model personality. And by that, I don't mean like the one we should all try to be like. I just mean that when somebody is an actual model, it's because their face is completely symmetrical. In American culture, this is what we consider beautiful. We actually consider something less beautiful if it's less symmetrical. I mean, think about Jay Leno. He's a great guy, but not a lot of us would say, oh, he's so handsome, put him on the cover of GQ. I mean, his, his chin is just disproportionately um, mm -hmm. large. And so the more balanced, the more beautiful we tend to consider. And phlegmatics are a very balanced personality. They're not extra loud, they're not extra detailed, they're not um, trying to grab control. They're just kind of an amazingly well-rounded personality. And then the next thing is they're kind of the chameleon personality. Yeah, this is my daughter's favorite character in Tangle. And that is they adapt. They shift based on the needs of the situation and the needs of the family. And so they can actually seem to be sanguine or seem to be melancholy or seem to be choleric. And you're like, well, what? Split personality? No. Well, well, once you know their goal, it'll be really easy for you to identify the phlegmatics in your life and whether you might be phlegmatic. And then the next thing is that comfort comes all. 
mean, doesn't that just look like you just want to dive in and lay yes. there, kind of this nice seafoam green and, and all plushy comfort is huge. All right, to identify the phlegmatic, we need to know their goal. And it's represented by this soothing aloe relief lotion, soothing peace. Peace is their goal. And here's the kicker though, it's often peace at all cost. And that cost may be the cost of who they are as a person. Because they want peace so badly that they may just say, forget me, forget my, my preferences, I won't even speak up, I'll do whatever it takes to keep the peace in this situation. And sometimes that can be an amazing act of sacrifice that God is leading, and sometimes it can be people pleasing, which is incredibly um, deadly thing. The book that I'm working on with Kathy, I was going to write the book about perfectionism, which is my, what I thought my issue was, and I surveyed a bunch of women, and I threw people pleasing on the survey, and the results came back, and I was stunned, because people said the two things that they said happen when there's too much people pleasing is that you become resentful and bitter. And I went, well, I'm resentful and bitter, but I'm not a people pleaser. What happened? <laughs> it meant I was a people pleaser. I just didn't recognize it. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Um, so peace, peace at all costs. I had a student a number of years ago uh, named Susan, and she had come with a couple of friends to help me get my classroom ready for school, the first day of school. And we went to 31 Flavors afterwards for kind of a little reward, a thank you. And everybody ordered their ice cream. She, I could hear her clearly when she ordered her ice cream. I knew what she'd asked for. And when the order came back, it was not what she asked for. And the other two girls looked at me and said, this always happens to Susan. Well, I'm a choleric. I do not stand for this. And I thought, this is my moment to advocate for this young woman and show her how it's done. So I marched up to that counter, and in, in no uncertain terms, I told them what she had ordered, that this was not what she ordered, and it was completely unacceptable, and they needed to give her what she had ordered. What I was not hearing is Susan standing there going, I'll eat it, I'll eat it, I'll eat it. And I'm like, once I finally heard that, I'm like, no, you won't. You will only get what you asked for. This is not right. Well, she got what she asked for, and she could not eat it. In the car on the way back to her house, she was so upset by how I had treated the person at Fenwick Flavors. A complete stranger who was hired to give us the ice cream we asked for. It didn't matter. She would rather have eaten the ice cream that she did not order than have conflict happen between people, even somebody she didn't know or care about. And that was a hard lesson for me to learn, that I had violated Susan worse than the person who hadn't heard her and given her her ice cream the way she asked for it. What I did was actually worse than that because I had stomped over her actual needs and, and said, no, I know it's better for you than you know yourself. I did not give her her voice. That's how much peace is important. The second primary need of a phlegmatic is represented by this driver's license and it's respect. And it's respect for who they actually are as a person. My husband and I, um, our first year married, decided we were going to start a family tradition of our own. We weren't going to go to his family. We weren't going to go to my family. We were going to stay, just the two of us. And uh, so I decided to make all the food from my side of the family, which we have Armenian food on Thanksgiving Day. And he, his family comes from the mid Midwest, so they're the meat and potatoes and you know that whole kind of stuff. So I had about 20 dishes that I was going to make for Thanksgiving. So Thanksgiving dawns, it's just the two of us, and so I asked him, what time do you want to have Thanksgiving dinner? Because my mother taught me, you pick the time, and you have the hot food's hot, the cold food's cold, and you serve within 15 seconds of that time. 15 seconds either time, wait, is, is fine, but I mean, that's how perfect things were done when I was raised. And so my husband, when I asked him, what time do you want to have dinner, he says, I don't care. <laughs> well, how does a caller deal with that kind of an answer? I said, well, what time do you want to eat? And he said, I don't, I don't care. care. I gave him one more chance, and he said, I don't care. I'm like, fine, we're eating at 3 o'clock. And so I planned and planned and cooked and cooked and cooked and planned. And at 2.55, he laid down on the couch. And at 2.56, he was Sorry. snoring. And guess what I did at 3 o'clock? I served, and I woke that man up. Because we were eating Thanksgiving dinner at 3 o'clock. So he sat down at the table. And uh, I served, and he had a bite of everything, and guess what he was doing at 3.05? He was back on the couch sleeping. Yeah. So um, he woke up, and I will not tell you what happened after that, because I look very bad in that part of the story. We had words, and none of them were appropriate or valuable to a relationship. And so the next year, we went to his family, and Thanksgiving dawned, and somewhere like 9 o'clock, a family member shows up with something in a, in a dish and sets it out in the kitchen. I'm like, what? 
It's not three o'clock in the afternoon. What are they doing here? And throughout the day, people just keep showing up and bringing things. I'd never seen a menu. I had not seen a list of who was bringing what. And there were paper plates. Paper plates were brought out. My mother, we always used the china she brought over from Germany. She was a home ec major. She knew how. She was the kind who didn't wear white when you're not supposed to wear white. I don't know what those dates are, but she knew. Okay, there was there was a way for everything to be done. And um, and then as more and more people came, and like we grazed all day long, which was freaky for me. And then there were lawn chairs out in the backyard is where people sat. Unlike the, the table that my mother set, and our biggest entertainment for Thanksgiving Day was moving the centerpiece. She would always have this huge centerpiece but that we couldn't see each other or talk. So she would go into the kitchen to get some more food, we'd move the centerpiece. She'd come back, serve the food, put the centerpiece back. And we just, and that was, that was Thanksgiving dinner. We, we even had little place cards with our names. Now, we always knew who was there, but the place cards told us where. So that was, to me, the right way to do Thanksgiving. And I got to the end of the day at my husband's house with the paper plates and the lawn chairs, and the police did not arrest anybody. I was kind of like waiting for them to show up, but no, they didn't show up. <laughs> you want to guess which was the more fun Thanksgiving? Yeah. My husband's family was way more fun. We were relaxed, we were chill, we just got together and talked. The, 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 the goal of the day was not to do things right. The goal of the day was to be with people and to actually have time to be thankful. And the lesson I learned is that I had been incredibly disrespectful to my husband the year before in insisting that my way was the only way for things to be done. And over the years, it, I mean, I could tell you story after story of ways that I've had to learn that there are other ways for things to be done that are, quotes, just as valid and often they're a whole lot better and sometimes a whole lot easier. I mean, of course, what was dishwashing like when there were paper plates used? Here's the trash bag, okay, we're done. <laughs> so much easier, so much easier. And then the next neat, major need of a phlegmatic is represented by this mirror, and that is self-worth. Self-worth, and often the phlegmatic personality needs those of us who love them to reflect back what we see in them, because often they don't see these qualities in themselves. Often, especially if they're a child, well, they're not probably getting the straight A's in a melancholy would. They're probably not going to be in student leadership the way the choleric is. They're probably not voted most popular cheerleader, you know, like the same would. And so they start going, what am I good at? And I'll tell you as a teacher what they're good at, citizenship. Mm -hmm. But do we value this in America anymore? I mean, they are great, wonderful people who are busy taking care. They're the ones who, when everybody leaves my room a mess, they sit and pick up the trash and put it in the trash can. I mean, they notice these little details, and slowly, without any fanfare, they're busy taking care of people. Those, um, that, that's part of their role as caretaker. Um, my first year teaching, I had a student in my class by the name of Matt, and he wanted to try out for the drama uh, group that I led. And his mother came to me all in a flurry, and she's like, um, 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 I'm just so worried because of what you know. I'm like, no, I don't know. She's like, well, you know. Well, Matt had a lisp. And so she told me she was very worried that he was going to embarrass himself on stage. Now, I had been with Matt by that time for like a whole month. I was teaching seventh and eighth grade. He talked nonstop. He had lots of friends. And I thought, I think I know who's worried about being embarrassed with Matt on stage. And I don't think it's Matt so much. But I didn't say that out loud. I was only 22. And, you know, she was much older and much wiser. And so I said, okay. And we'll let him try out, and he makes it, I promise not to let him embarrass himself. So, okay, that was fine. He made the team. Then we had a big drama in the spring, and he wanted to try out for the lead role. And again, she heard about this, comes flurrying into me, you know, you know, you know. I'm like, just trust me. Just trust me. And he tried out for the lead. He got the lead, and he was fantastic in this spring play. Because I cast him in the part of a snake. And so, instead of trying to hide his list, he exaggerated, and he was a lisping snake. And he sounded like a snake because he hissed naturally. And his mother came to me afterwards as people were congratulating him and telling what a great job he did. And of course, you know, he stood like three feet taller that evening because he had you know, done this magnificent thing. And she came to me and she said, I had no idea he had it in him. And I didn't say this out loud, but I thought to myself, I'm just a 22-year-old kid, and I saw it. How did you not see it? Now. I've said this to groups of women before and had some come up to me and say, that was harsh. You shouldn't think that. Mother's job is to protect their child and to keep them from experiencing pain. My kids are 20 and 22. I have done way too much damage in their lives by keeping them from experiencing normal pain, acceptable pain. I bought into the philosophy that said all pain and all disappointment is horrible. No, there's abuse, there's neglect, and then there's just part of normal life where you try something and it doesn't work out and it makes you more resilient. 
And that was the kind of thing that she was trying to, to shelter him from. I really wasn't that critical about her. I just happened to have the fresh perspective as a new teacher just out of college to go, hey, he's great, he's comfortable in his own skin, let's try it. And so I've always been glad that he had the opportunity to do that. And I wish I had learned about the whole smother mother thing from her. I sadly did not learn the lessons I could have from her there. All right, so here's what a phlegmatic is thinking, perhaps not consciously, but these are the songs that run her mind, her emotions, and often her choices. The first one is, don't worry, be yeah. happy. The next one is, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, respect. respect. And the last one is one of the most wonderful, awful country songs, want to talk about me. Because phlegmatics will listen, 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 but every now and again, they just want to talk about me. Well, what is all of this personality information going to do for you? I could go on, like I said, for another um, two or three days on this, but I'm going to give you one principle and close with a story that I think really illustrates the value. First of all, you get to know your own needs and your own personality goals and your own needs, and you take responsibility for getting them met. Nobody else can meet them for you. Nobody else is going to read your mind and take care of yourself. We as individuals have to know our goal, know our needs, and make sure that those get met. And then, when you know the goal and needs of other people, then you can adjust your approach and you can adapt your expectations of them so that you don't expect great joy out of a more serious melancholy. And you don't expect tons of achievement out of the more laid back, phlegmatic. But probably the most useful time that, um, that the personalities have come into play in my life was, again, going about 10, 10 years ago, maybe eight or nine years ago at this stage, uh, we went to my husband's family for um, Thanksgiving, and I had taken all my recipe cards with me. They are neatly typed and laminated. My mother had given to them to me as a wedding gift. And I got to his uh, parents, uh, family's house, and um, the nearest grocery store was about 45 minutes away. And so I made the drive there and got there, and then the same when rain turned on, I'm like, oops, I have no list and I have no recipe cards. And I'm 45 minutes away from the house. So I call the house, nobody's answering. And I know that I can remember about two-thirds of what I need, but I know that if I try to do the shopping by memory, I'm going to get back and have left something really important. And so the thought comes into my mind, call mother. And I think, no, if I call my mother, she will criticize me. She will say, didn't I raise you better than this? Didn't I raise you to make lists? Don't you have a copy of my shopping list somewhere? And I'm like, oh, I hate it when my mother criticizes me, because of course, as a saying when I want approval. I'm like, if I go 45, 45, that's an hour and a half. Okay, I'll call mother. So I pull out my cell phone, I call my mother, and sure enough, she does exactly what I predict. I'm like, mother, guess where I am? Guess what I've done? She's like, didn't I teach you better? Didn't I raise you better? And yeah, yeah. So she goes to the kitchen, she gets her perfectly typed and laminated um, recipe cards and comes and she's reading the, to the um, ingredients to me. And of course, I'm busily writing with a stub of pencil on the back of an envelope that I dug out of the bottom of my purse. And as I'm listening, I'm like, she is enjoying this way too much. She is just getting a thrill out of me screwing up yet again and being able to go, aha, uh -huh, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're not the perfect daughter you ought to be. And then I thought, oh, maybe that's not it. I'm hearing something that sounds like enjoyment in her voice, but maybe she's not really enjoying criticizing me. Maybe there's something else. And so I kind of decided to test the theory, and one of the things that I was supposed to buy was breadcrumbs. So I was like, Mother, um, wait a second, don't get off the phone. What kind of breadcrumbs do I get? And I went to the breadcrumb aisle, and there's plain and garlic and Italian and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, oh, no, 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 don't get that, don't get that. And she tells me exactly what brand and where it's going to be on the shelf and exactly what it looks like. And, and I'm starting to think, there's something here, and I'm not picking up what it is. So I, I decided to, to keep, keep doing this with each ingredient. And she would tell me where to go and what to find and exactly what to get. And I finally realized she was enjoying it because she missed me that we had spent my growing up years in the kitchen together and here suddenly she's able to do this long distance shopping with me and I thought the intensity that I've always misunderstood as criticism is her perfectionistic desire, her melancholy desire for the world to be perfect for me. Not for me to be perfect, but for the world to be a good enough place for the daughter that she loves. And I thought, what if I started listening to what I used to think was criticism, and I put it through the filter of, I love you, Sherry, I love you, Sherry, and I let it come out the other side as something I recognize, rather than being all, you know, tense every time she criticized me. And so I started practicing that for a couple of years, and no matter what it was she said, I was like, okay, this is going to go through the filter that she cares so much, she wants the world to be perfect for me, and then I'll come out and just say, okay, I'm hearing whatever it is, I'm going to hear it as my mother saying she loves me.
Eight years ago, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And it's been three years since she's had any idea who on earth I am. But I'm so grateful that I had those few years because now she is the most calm, non-critical, relaxed person you could ever want to meet. And I would give anything to have my mother back the way she was. But I had that gift of those few years of understanding what it was she was trying to express to me in her way. I was able to adapt because of the personalities and say, you know, you can't flex for me, so I'm going to flex for you. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is the why. The why, if it is possible, and much of the time it is, as far as it depends on us, and sometimes it really does, sometimes the burden is on us to adapt and flex, to live at peace with everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah. This is a miracle. It's 57 minutes. 57. Okay, 58. Two minutes short for saying what. Thank you so much, you guys. Ladies.